Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dennis Coyce, Executive Director of De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum is the largest park of its kind in New England, encompassing 30 acres northwest of Boston. Dennis has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dennis, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation. So let's talk about De Cordova. Talk about the, the physical plant, and it's, it's quite extraordinary, 30 acres, 60 works? It is. It's uh, both a sculpture park and a museum. So it's we're a contemporary art institution. The 30 acres hold sculptures from uh, sort of modern art up to made last week. And then we have galleries and interior spaces that fulfill all the things you'd expect a normal contemporary art institution to have. And the landscape is quintessentially New England. It's located just down the road from Walden Pond. So it has these beautiful vistas and views and a pond and forests. And uh, it's a quite stunning environment for contemporary art. And, and your guests come in and do they experience the, the, the park first or do they, do they tend to experience the contemporary? That's a great question we've been wrestling with actually. And you know, they come in now, they drive in and uh, sort of park in the park. So typically they've come through a portion of the park first and then they often will transit that in the summer and make their way around. Uh, obviously in the dead of winter, they're less likely to spend their time freezing outside. So they'll be inside for the program. Uh, but we get about 120,000 visitors a year, and uh, the vast majority of those, I think, know us first as a sculpture park, and then secondarily as a museum that has galleries as well. So the sculpture park itself, the 30 acres, in a sense, also functions as your entryway, as your introduction into the environment, into the thinking, into the meditation that your visitors will undertake. How does that affect how you program the, the museum and how you treat the, the, the whole institution? I think you know the opportunity is there to make something really special happen because what uh, you can do outside in a park with contemporary art is quite different from what you can do in a gallery setting. And I think people are so much more uh, open to the kinds of experiences that contemporary art demands in a park setting than they are in a gallery. And so we're thinking a lot about how those two programs complement each other and push each other forward. And so for a lot of visitors, that first experience with sculptures outdoors, many, many folks will not have visited a park before and they'll get there and uh, that is a whole different world from the kinds of experience you're used to in a, in a museum of any type really. Well, and, and what I find so interesting about uh, outdoor spaces in which art resides is the interactivity that occurs not only between the works and the, the viewer uh, or the experiencer, uh, but also between the environment and the work, the environment and the viewer. In a, in a conventional museum, you're walking into a space that is uh, where, where people are speaking in hushed tones. You have the work on the wall. Um, if you're lucky, it's isolated, but very often there's a lot of interfering noise from other mm -hmm. works that, mm -hmm. are, that are in close proximity. And you are given an experience that is quite concentrated. Now that's not possible in an outdoor experience where you don't control what actually happens to the, to the user. That's correct. I mean, in, in the sort of very uh, truest sense of the word, that's a self-directed experience out there. Mm -hmm. And I think the real challenge for sculpture parks or contemporary institutions is often to get viewers to uh, sort of look with new eyes. It's what every museum tries to do. It's what I spent a long time uh, trying to do as a designer at museums before I became a director. You're trying to get people to let go of those preconceptions of what they're going to see. And I think the real beauty of a sculpture park is because they're outside, because there are no hush tones, because their kids can run around, their dog can come with them if they want, um, they're much more open to those kinds of experiences outdoors than they are in. And so it's to our real advantage that what they see first is that park. The curatorial uh, approach also needs to be adjusted for the fact that you're dealing with an environment that changes. So people who visit in the spring are going to have a different experience than people who visit in the fall. Of course, uh, you're yeah. going to, And there's going to be a lot less that's within the control of the, of the curator because the environment is not something that the, the, that the curator can control. Absolutely within. not. But the, artist, the artists do and can, and that's the beauty of it, I think, is that they're so uh, interested in that outdoor life of an object and in their work seen in those kinds of contexts. So you know, I have yet to run across an artist who hasn't thought very carefully about working outdoors and the way to cite their work and the, the seasonality of it and what it will look like with snow. And sometimes they don't know. And to them, it's a great experiment as well. And I think one of the things that we uh, are trying to do very carefully at De Cordova is to be an artist-centric institution. So we're very uh, thoughtful about inviting artists in to do things they couldn't do anywhere else. 
Uh, they can't do this in a gallery. They can't do this at a traditional institution. And so they can do something there that is very unique. It's a very unusual opportunity for a lot of the artists we work with. And often we're the first time they've worked outdoors in a really serious way or in the particular way that they're going to work with us. So they're very thoughtful about it. Even though our curators lose some control, I think the artists sort of uh, are very excited to have that opportunity in front of them. So forgive my lack of knowledge, uh, but uh, how many of the pieces or were all of them cited by the actual artists themselves? It's a mix. We uh, have a collection of outdoor sculpture, not a huge collection, uh, and in fact we can talk about that, but we intentionally now are very picky about what we choose to collect, sort of above and beyond how we might be choosy for our regular uh, sort of photography and painting collections. Right. Uh, we have a number of works that are borrowed, so from the artists, from their gallerists, from collectors. Uh, and then we have uh, probably about a third of the work in the park is commissioned. So it's site specific or site relationed in that it is meant to be in a specific place for a specific duration. Um, and so the artist is working you know, in to help and choose that site most typically. So it's a real mix in the park. The, the real focus for De Cordova is to be an institution that's about the future of sculpture and where sculpture is going and truly be a contemporary art institution. And so much of what you see when you go visit a sculpture park, particularly in the United States, is a parking lot for the history of sculpture. So it's a, a double challenge, I think, to be both a sculpture park and a true contemporary art institution where you're pushing boundaries and you're letting these artists come in and do something new and it has a, a life. You know, We might only uh, commission a project that's for a year, for two years, maybe three at the very outside of what we do, but it's really quite quick and then we turn it over and, and give another artist a chance. And you just wrote an article on, on um, different perspectives and how art should be shaped and how the experience should be shaped. Comment a bit on, on what you wrote. The article I was responding to was a, a returning, uh, sort of describing a return to the primacy of the object and that, that something was lost in these kinds of participatory experiences. And really to me, um, you know, my response and what I wrote for Slate was really this idea that you one can't have one without the other, that ultimately, you know, art is an experience, viewing an object is an experience, it's a very personal uh, sort of relationship to an object. And museums can't afford either to be uh, tone deaf to what culture is doing right now. And right now, you know, culture is very much, uh, you know, about looking at uh, yourself and self-curating your life and, you know, your Facebook posts and your tweets and sort of how you present yourself to the world. And artists are responding to that and also in some ways um, positing or putting forward work that is a pushback to all of that. And so a lot of the work is very social and it's relational aesthetics. It's looking into the, the areas of art that don't seem like art to a lot of a general audience. One of the things that I find to be very interesting is the idea of the museum and its environs as a, as a canvas and mm -hmm. the works itself as, as your paint. Uh, but many um, uh, museum directors see see this as a, uh, differently. How, how do you see hmm. the craft of managing the museum, presenting art, um, uh, being a, an orchestrator? How would you place, from your perspective, the terms of being an executive director of, a, of an organization that's like an, Cordova? Well, that's a really interesting question. I think uh, for us in particular, I can't of course speak to others and, and how they're approaching right. it, but for De Cordova in particular, really, I think my role there is to be an enabler or a, an accomplice, if you will, to a talented group of people who need to be pushed to take risks. A co-conspirator? A co-conspirator, absolutely, within bounds. <laughs> um, unindicted, though, I would point out. Okay. I'm an unindicted co-conspirator. Um, but, you know, we're really there to push some boundaries. And if the staff is not enabled to do that by having it made okay to make mistakes, for the institution to try and innovate and take some risks, some of those will pay out, some of them will fail. Uh, ultimately, we're not going to ever succeed. If we only stick to what we know is going to work as a contemporary institution in particular, I think we're going to fail. And uh, so we're really pushing hard to try and break new ground in a lot of the territory, not just aesthetically, but operationally and uh, programmatically in what we're doing. So an example I might use is we, um, like many museums, we're beating our heads against the wall of the public school systems as schools have moved towards testing, as they right. have 
uh, had limited funds for busing, all kinds of you know, reasons that museums uh, have had a harder and harder time engaging with the public schools in a meaningful way. And instead of sort of lamenting that state and trying to throw more of the same programs at this problem, we decided to um, essentially abolish all of our uh, sort of existing school outreach programs and start something new. And so what we decided to do is we, we uh, essentially partnered with a local preschool. We decided to try and catch these families and these kids before they get into the public schools, essentially to turn this problem on its head and innovate and try something new. And so we've launched the first embedded uh, preschool at a contemporary art institution in the U.S. And so these are kids, we have 60 kids who are on campus all day, every day, uh, five days a week throughout the school year and they are partners with the artists and the staff of the museum in sort of advancing this idea that art matters and that environment matters in learning and so we're uh, you know it's both a lovely rainbows and unicorns kind of experiment and that it sounds charming but it has some real meat behind it in that we are studying these kids we're going to be studying them over a decade uh, with some project partners, Leslie University and Project Zero at Harvard, to essentially track whether you can demonstrate that these kids have a better take rate on cultural pursuits, meaning do they sign up for elective art? Do they, are they more in tune with music? Are they uh, engaged with the kinds of cultural options they have and their family has 10 years down the road than kids who didn't come through this kind of a program and went through the same public schools? And I think that is a really interesting experiment for a museum to undertake. Will it succeed? You know, I believe it will, but it could fail, and that's probably got to be okay too. And so, really, we're trying to push these bounds and make it all right to, to innovate. I find your description to be so interesting because, in a sense, what you've done <coughs> is you've scraped the canvas. You have developed this approach. You've created this work, and it's not working at a certain point. So you go and you scrape the canvas and you start again. You're, you're reusing certain elements of what you've done in the past, but you have created a whole new work and you've created whole new partnerships, a whole new model, and you know that that second work that you've done, that you've painted over top of your, your old work, might also not work. And sure. You'll scrape the canvas again. Sure. Who's paying for it? Who's paying for it? Uh, our donors, who are big believers in the fact that the institution has a role of uh, presenting this kinds of innovation, both within the world of, in this particular project, the schools, and within the role of its uh, life in the museum world. And so there's a lot of interest in this project from both ends. So uh, they're co-conspirators to your co-conspirators? I've convinced all of them to be co-conspirators co as well, yes. It's an ever-growing conspiracy and, into Cordova. And, and the conspiracy includes <laughs> the school system <laughs> and, and, and the funders and so on? That's right. Well, up to a point, I think. You know, institutions have to be willing to find uh, effective <laughs> partners, right? And so we were not getting where we needed to get with the local right. public school systems, which are fantastic schools. I mean, this is not, yes. uh, you know, an issue. Massachusetts has wonderful schools. Um, but we weren't seeing the kinds of connection we needed to see as an institution to address a problem that I think all museums uh, have, you know, share concern about, which is where will our future audiences come from? There's a great deal of data that shows if, if uh, children and families aren't exposed to culturals early, they will not become lifetime participants. So if we're being locked out of the public schools as institutions and within mm -hmm. across the field, as you know, it's our responsibility ultimately to find a solution to that problem and to experiment and innovate and try and find another path. And so uh, you know, I'm proud to be a part of trying to find that path, whether or not our particular answer will be the path we all end up on as museums 20 years from now, I don't know. I certainly hope it will be. But we're, I think, doing important work in trying to help advance the field of museums even as it's solving a very particular problem that Decordova has. So we're trying to think very strategically uh, across the field even as we as an institution are doing things that are meaningful for us and our mission. So you're, you talked about one approach <laughs> to education for children. Talk about your education and public programming for adults. The uh, programs that we have, uh, let me back up and say, you know, for adults, uh, we have similarly re-engineered what De Cordova has offered. We uh, have offered traditionally a very similar slate to what you would find at a lot of contemporary mm -hmm. institutions. Um, we have, over the last few years, brought in some new educators uh, who are thinking about what's next in museum education. And so while, uh, like many museums, we use uh, visual thinking strategies, which right. is the tried and true 20-year-plus uh, method for engaging audiences, I think there's a valid question to be asked, which is what's next? There, that can't be the end of museum education. It didn't end in 1978, and there will be nothing else developed in the next 100 years. Somebody will come up with what is next to, to help grow from VTS and buttress it, not just 
it's not a replacement, but it's a growth from it. And so uh, with our adult programs and with our uh, sort of regular visitation programs, we're making those very customized to visitor needs, very artist-centric. Uh, and so these are providing ways for visitors to engage directly with the artists themselves. So providing behind the scenes artist installation tours. When we have an artist out in the park for two or three weeks uh, installing a huge project, we don't just want them there working in a vacuum. We're bringing visitors to them and having the visitors interact with that artist, having them talk through the visitors, what their process is, how they live as an artist, what this project means to them, uh, and what it means to us as an institution. And sort of allowing the visitor to connect with the artist or the art in a very directed and different way. Um, and each of the programs we're offering to adults are very specific to those groups' needs. So whether it's uh, sort of pioneering and trying some new methods in touch touring for you know sort of sight impaired visitors, uh, doing Alzheimer's tours, doing uh, you know tours for uh, you know school kids, they're all very uniquely tailored to those audiences' needs. And we're really trying to be responsive to the groups we're partnering with rather than offering sort of a rote menu and saying choose choose from the Chinese menu. It's you know, what are you is looking for as a, a partner with us and what can we provide to you that's specific. Are contemporary artists involved in shaping these programs as well as developing their art for the site? Or is, is this a situation where the curators have their role, the artists have their role, and, and ne'er ne the twain shall meet? It depends on the artist. Some of the artists are very taken with those ideas and those models and they are very active participants or even sort of volunteer themselves up to be participants. And other artists would be happy uh, to never have to deal with the public. And so we try and be very respectful of that regardless of what the artist's position is. But there's always a way to find, to connect uh, the audience to what the artists are doing and what they're talking about. So we, we try and sort of navigate that uh, case by case and be very uh, specific in sort of our approach. And one of the beauties of being a not huge institution is we can be very customized. We can be very sort of responsive to audience and to artists and the specific situation we find ourselves in. And that's, uh, I think, the beauty of Decord of it. It's just big enough that can do some really important, innovative work, but it's small enough that we don't have a lot of the bureaucracy and a lot of the um, you know, sort of uh, inertia issues you would get with a huge institution. So we can be pretty nimble on this stuff. And that's where I think what museums will be looking at next is going to come from. You know, in, a, in an era where every audience member expects to be able to curate their own experience, curate their own life, customize what's offered to them, go and seek what they want, institutions that just offer up a standardized menu are going to, I think, fare very poorly. I think ultimately the institutions that can be responsive and nimble and meet people halfway in the best sense of that term will be the ones that are going to succeed. So you're not going to become a pandering organization that is that is whiplashed back and forth trying to rush to, um, to uh, satisfy each of your individual audience members. On the other hand, you're not going to become a distant and standoffish institution where the audience doesn't matter. You present what you present and they can either come and like it or lump it. You're uh, hopefully we will strike the perfect balance. That's exactly you're well described. That every day. Uh, very much so, and I think you know, to not pander, you ultimately have to have the confidence of your curatorial ambitions and your curatorial standards. And so, as an institution, what we show, what we collect, uh, continues has elevated and continues to elevate from where De Cordova has uh, sort of historically been known to exist in the art world. We're very ambitious in what we're showing, uh, in the kinds of pr uh, presentations and projects we're partnering on. Um, the example I might use is. Um, we're the first organization to co-produce a project with Madison Square Art in New York. This gigantic Orly Genger installation that was in New York this past summer is right this minute as we're speaking being reinstalled at Decord of an entirely new uh, site-specific responsive venue. It will live there for a year, so it will live through four seasons, uh, unlike in New York where it was just a, a summer installation. And it's a huge undertaking. It's a, a, a very ambitious one curatorially. If that standard and that quality is there in everything we do, Meeting the audience halfway doesn't imply any kind of uh, watering down of that uh, sort of quality level or mission. It's how can you provide points of engagement for those audiences that let them understand that work in a more meaningful way for them, even as you're pushing the boundaries of how uh, challenging some of that work is. And contemporary art, if it's done well, should be challenging. Do you ever undertake a project that some people really hate? Yes, we've done that. <laughs> I'm not sure I would do it every day. Uh, but we uh, have undertaken projects that I think some components of our audience have not been excited about. 
Um, and in fact, I would say as a director, if I like everything we're doing, something's wrong, even for me personally, and this is what I've often said to my board members. So you've authorized things that you don't like. That I personally am not, it would not be my cup of tea, but I've been convinced by my curatorial staff that for the reasons that they can articulate and be very clear about that this is meaningful within the context of the sweep of art history, the sweep of sculpture right now, about where sculpture is going. You know, if, if as an institution we can't uh, push some boundaries, push some buttons, we're not doing something right. Including so, your own. Including my own. And I think uh, it would be a sad day when you visit a museum where I like everything. It would not look, <laughs> it would not be a place you would probably visit, uh, pay to visit, I would think. I would think, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where if as an institution we can have a healthy dialogue about what art is and we're always questioning some of our own decisions and having to explain to each other what we're doing, I think it leads to a really um, pervasive sense of optimism and excitement for our audiences. And you know, if, if they sense that the museum is bored, they're going to be bored. If they sense that this institution is vibrant and having a dialogue with art and with itself, I think they're going to really enjoy themselves. It makes me want to go right out and, and visit the, the Dakota of a Sculpture Garden and Museum. Dennis Coyce, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. Thank you. It's a pleasure.